This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Benjamin Franklin, Letter to the Editor, Journal de Paris, April 26, 1784. Read by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, March 2007. Monsieur, you often entertain us with accounts of new discoveries. Permit me to communicate to the public, through your paper, one that has lately been made by myself, and which I conceive may be of great utility. I was the other evening in a grand company, where the new lamp of Messrs. Kinkay and Lang was introduced, and much admired for its splendor. But a general inquiry was made whether the oil it consumed was not in proportion to the light it afforded, in which case there would be no saving in the use of it. No one present can satisfy us in that point, which all agreed ought to be known, it being a very desirable thing to lessen, if possible, the expense of lighting our apartments, when every other article of family expense was so much augmented. I was pleased to see this general concern for the economy, for I loved the economy exceedingly. I went home, and to bed, three or four hours after midnight, with my head full of the subject. An accidental sudden noise waked me about six in the morning, when I was surprised to find my room filled with light, and I imagined at first that a number of those lamps had been brought into it, but, rubbing my eyes, I perceived the light came in at the windows. I got up and looked out to see what might be the occasion of it when I saw the sun just rising above the horizon, from whence he poured his rays plentifully into my chamber, my domestic having negligently omitted the preceding evening to close the shutters. I looked at my watch, which goes very well, and found that it was but six o'clock, and still thinking it something extraordinary that the sun should rise so early, I looked into the almanac, where I found it to be the hour given for his rising on that day. I looked forward, too, and found he was to rise still earlier every day till towards the end of June, and that at no time in the year he retarded his rising so long as till eight o'clock. Your readers, who with me have never seen any signs of sunshine before noon, and seldom regard the astronomical part of the almanac, will be as much astonished as I was when they hear of his rising so early, and especially when I assure them that he gives light as soon as he rises. I am convinced of this. I am certain of my fact. One cannot be more certain of any fact. I saw it with my own eyes. And having repeated this observation the three following mornings, I found always precisely the same result. Yet it so happens that when I speak of this discovery to others, I can easily perceive by their countenances, though they forbear expressing it in words, that they do not quite believe me. One, indeed, who is a learned natural philosopher, has assured me that I must certainly be mistaken as to the circumstance of light coming into my room. For it being well known, as he says, that there could be no light abroad at that hour, it follows that none could enter from without, and that, of consequence, my windows being accidentally left open, instead of letting in the light, had only served to let out the darkness. And he used many ingenious arguments to show me how I might, by that means, have been deceived. I own that he puzzled me a little, but he did not satisfy me, and the subsequent observations I made, as above mentioned, confirmed me in my first opinion. This event has given rise in my mind to several serious and important reflections. I considered that, if I had not been awakened so early in the morning, I should have slept six hours longer by the light of the sun, and in exchange have lived six hours the following night by candlelight and, the latter being a much more expensive light than the former, my love of economy induced me to muster up what little arithmetic I was master of, and to make some calculations, which I shall give you, after observing that utility is, in my opinion, the test of value in matters of invention, and that a discovery which can be applied to no use, or is not good for something, is good for nothing. I took for the basis of my calculation the supposition that there are 100,000 families in Paris, and that these families consume in the night half a pound of boogies, or candles, per hour. I think this is a moderate allowance, taking one family with another, 
for though I believe some consume less, I know that many consume a great deal more. Then estimating seven hours per day as the medium quantity, between the time of the sun's rising and hours, he rising during the six following months from six to eight hours before noon, and there being seven hours of course per night in which we burn candles, the account will stand thus. In the six months between the 20th of March and the 20th of September, there are nights, 183, hours of each night in which we burn candles, 7. Multiplication gives for the total number of hours, 1,281. These 1,281 hours, multiplied by 100,000, the number of inhabitants, gives 128,100,000. 128 millions and 100,000 hours spent at Paris by candlelight, which, at half a pound of wax and tallow per hour, gives the weight of 64 million 50,000. 64 millions and 50,000 of pounds, which, estimating the whole at the median price of 30 sols the pound, makes the sum of 96 millions and 75,000 livres tournois. Colon, ninety six million seventy five thousand. An immense sum. That the city of Paris might save each year by the economy of using sunshine instead of candles. If it should be said that people are apt to be obstinately attached to old customs, and that it will be difficult to induce them to rise before noon, consequently my discovery can be of little use. I answer nil disparatum. I believe all who have common sense as soon as they have learned from this paper that it is daylight when the sun rises, will contrive to rise with him, and, to compel the rest, I would propose the following regulations. First, let a tax be laid of a Lewis per window on every window that is provided with shutters to keep out the light of the sun. Second, let the same salutary operation of police be made use of to prevent our burning candles that inclined us last winter to be more economical in burning wood, that is, let guards be placed in the shops of the wax and tallow chandlers, and no family be permitted to be supplied with more than one pound of candles per week. Third, let guards also be posted to stop all the coaches, etc., that would pass the streets after sunset, except those of physicians, surgeons, and midwives. Fourth, every morning, as soon as the sun rises, let all the bells in every church be set ringing, and if that is not sufficient, let a cannon be fired in every street to wake the sluggards effectually, and to make them open their eyes to see their true interest. All the difficulty will be in the first two or three days, after which the Reformation will be as natural and as easy as the present irregularity. For ce n'est que le premier pas qu'à coûte. Oblige a man to rise at four in the morning, and it is more than probable he will go willingly to bed at eight in the evening. And... Having had eight hours of sleep, he will rise more willingly at four in the morning following. But this sum of ninety-six millions and seventy-five thousand livres is not the whole of what may be saved by my economical project. You may observe that I have calculated upon only one half of the year, and much may be saved in the other, though the days are shorter. Besides, the immense stock of wax and tallow left unconsumed during the summer will probably make candles much cheaper for the ensuing winter, and continue them cheaper as long as the proposed reformation shall be supported. For the great benefit of this discovery, thus freely communicated and bestowed by me on the public, I demand neither place, pension, exclusive privilege, nor any reward whatever. I expect only to have the honor of it. And yet I know there are little envious minds who will, as usual, deny me this and say that my invention was known to the ancients, and perhaps they may bring passages out of the old books in proof of it. I will not dispute with these people that the ancients knew not the sun would rise at certain hours. They possibly had, as we have, almanacs that predicted it. But it does not follow thence that they knew he gave light as soon as he rose. This is what I claim as my discovery. If the ancients knew it, it might have been long since forgotten, for it certainly was unknown to the moderns, at least to the Parisians, which to prove I need but one plain simple argument. They are as well instructed, judicious, and prudent a people as exist anywhere in the world all professing, like myself, 
to be lovers of economy, and, from the many heavy taxes required from them by the necessities of the state, have surely an abundant reason to be economical. I say it is impossible that so sensible a people, under such circumstances, should have lived so long by the smoky, unwholesome, and enormously expensive light of candles, if they had really known that they might have had as much pure light of the sun for nothing. I am, etc., a subscriber. Signed, Benjamin Franklin. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The Tragedy at Harper's Ferry The Liberator October 28, 1859 By William Lloyd Garrison Recorded for LibriVox.org by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, March 2007 We have devoted a large portion of our present number to the publication of such particulars of the well-intentioned but sadly misguided effort of Captain John Brown and his score of Confederates at Harper's Ferry to liberate the slaves in Virginia, and ultimately throughout the South, as have been received, with the comments of various Democratic and Republican journals upon this outbreak, which are characterized by an equal mixture of ferocity and cowardice. As to the plot itself, it is evident that few or none were privy to it, except the little band directly engaged in it. For though Captain Brown had many to sympathize with him in different parts of the country, in view of his terrible bereavements, perils, and sufferings in Kansas, in defense of the freedom of that territory against border ruffian invasion, and were disposed to contribute not only to relieve his necessities, but also to facilitate the escape of slaves through his instrumentality to Canada, still an enterprise so wild and futile as this could not have received any countenance in that direction. As to Captain Brown, all who know him personally are united in the conviction that a more honest, conscientious, truthful, brave, disinterested man, friends, however misguided or unfortunate, close friends, does not exist. That he possesses a deeply religious nature, powerfully wrought upon by the trials through which he has passed, that he as sincerely believes himself to have been raised up by God to deliver the oppressed in this country, in the way he has chosen, as did Moses in relation to the deliverance of the captive Israelites that when he says he aims to be guided by the golden rule, it is no cant from his lips, but a vital application of it to his own soul. Quote, Remembering those that are in bonds as bound with them. End quote. That when he affirms that he had no other motive for his conduct at Harper's Ferry except to break the chains of the oppressed by shedding of the least possible amount of human blood, he speaks, quote, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, end quote. and that if he shall be, prince, as he will speedily be on a peradventure, close prince, put to death, he will not die ignobly, but as a martyr to a sympathy for a suffering race, and in defense of the sacred and inalienable rights of man, and will therefore deserve to be held in grateful and honorable remembrance to the latest posterity by all those who glory in the deeds of a Wallace or a Tell a Washington, or a Warren. Read his replies to the interrogatories propounded to him by Senator Mason and others. Is there another man, of all the thirty millions of people inhabiting this country, who could have answered more wisely, more impressively, more courageously, or with greater moral dignity under such a trying ordeal? How many hearts will be thrilled and inspired by his utterances? Read, too, his replies in court with reference to his counsel, where shall a more undaunted spirit be found? In vain will the sanguinary tyrants of the South and their northern minions seek to cover him with infamy. Courts, judges, can inflict no brand of shame or sap of death to shroud him from applause. For by the logic of Concord, Lexington, and Bunker Hill, and by the principles enforced by this nation in its boasted Declaration of Independence, Captain Brown was a hero, struggling against fearful odds, not for his own advantage, but to redeem others from a horrible bondage, to be justified in all that he aimed to achieve, however lacking in sound discretion. 
and by the same logic and the same principles every slaveholder has forfeited his right to live if his destruction be necessary to enable his victims to break the yoke of bondage and they and all who are disposed to aid them by force and arms are fully warranted in carrying rebellion to any extent and securing freedom at whatever cost it will be a terribly losing day for all slaveholders when john brown and his associates are brought to the gallows it will be sowing seed broadcast for a harvest of retribution. Their blood will cry trumpet-tongued from the ground, and that cry will be responded to by tens of thousands in a manner that shall cause the knees of the southern slave-mongers to smite together, as did those of Belshazzar of old. Oh, that they might avoid all this by a timely repentance! End of article this recording is in the public domain. From the New York Times, The Inauguration of the President of the Southern Confederacy, February 18, 1861, front page. This is read for LibriVox.org. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Inaugural Address of President Davis, Animated Debate in the Peace Conference, and the Policy and Purposes of Secession. Washington, Monday, February 18th. The Peace Conference were in session today upwards of five hours. The debate was the most animated of any since the commencement of the convention. The two reports from the committee were under consideration. The propositions respecting the territories, establishing or permitting slavery south of 36 degrees 30 minutes, were posed earnestly by gentlemen from New York, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Ohio, Illinois, and Wisconsin. Messrs. Tyler and Guthrie are leading advocates of the majority report and earnestly urged upon the convention immediate and direct action. They object decidedly to the proposition of Mr. Field of New York for a national convention on the ground that before such a convention can be held, unless some compromise be offered or adopted, all the border states will go out of the Union and will join the Southern Confederacy, binding themselves to that organization so strongly that the convention will be powerless to effect a reorganization. The tone of Jefferson Davis's speech is alluded to by them to substantiate the determination declared by the states which go out never to reunite with the North. A majority of Pennsylvanians, and some from all the northern states, it is now thought, will accept the majority report, which, with all the border state compromisers, will secure its adoption by a close vote. A canvas this morning of the conference shows only about half a dozen majority in its favor. The slave state representatives say that its adoption under such circumstances and by such a vote will be of no avail and will not be accepted as settlement, as it will not be an expression of the wishes of the free states. Several gentlemen have argued these points at length. The feasibility and constitutionality of the propositions in the report were discussed at considerable length. The anti-compromisers, headed by Messrs. Field and Notes of New York, Boutwell and Allen of Massachusetts, and one Illinois man, as earnestly met these arguments. They object to a direct compromise as being of no binding authority and unlikely to receive any sanction from Congress as the session is so nearly closed. They also object to them upon principle and under threats and to amendments to the Constitution by such process and without careful deliberation. They cannot see in them any remedy for existing difficulties and only a problematic prevention of further complications and troubles. The same difficulties will exist after their adoption as now, and even with these concessions granted, the border slave states will not consent to, no permit, any remedy for the frauds perpetrated by seceding states upon the federal government. The speech of Jefferson Davis alluded to, published this morning, amounts in their estimation to a declaration of war, and yet gentlemen propose that they should themselves do nothing about it. While the discussion was very spirited, the most amicable feelings were displayed on all sides. Mr. Tyler asked some of the anti-compromisers today in a private conversation if they would yield the Virginia proposition, the Crittenden Compromise, or anything against the spirit of the Chicago platform, or if direct compromise would not suit them as well as a national convention. He received a negative answer. He is said to have replied that if they maintain that position throughout this week without action in the right direction for a settlement, there would no longer be any hope of adjustment and they must prepare to recognize the consequences or involve the country in civil war. He has not, he says, quite given up all hope yet. A proposition was to be made for evening sessions this week. Batwell of Massachusetts made a long and eloquent speech today in convention against all compromise, said to be the most elaborate naval speech yet delivered. It attracted much attention and drew forth the debate which occupied the convention all day. 
He went so far as to advise the border states, as suggested by Soames of Maine, in his recent speech in the House, of the necessity of conciliating and agreeing with the North for their own safety. Guthrie afterwards approached Mr. Batwell, Allen, Field, and Crowenshield, and said he did not stand upon his proposition, nor did Kentucky demand creditants or any particular measure as an alternative, asking what they would give and intimating that they would agree to anything which presented a basis of adjustment. They replied, offering a national convention. They think this proposition rapidly gaining in favor and express the belief that now no other can pass. Jefferson Davis' speech at Montgomery attracts considerable attention. His braggadocia and threats are the subject of ridicule and excite no fear here. It is only tending to strengthen the anti-compromise feeling. His inaugural address, or that part of it which is received here tonight, but not yet made public, I learn from private sources, takes strong ground against reconstruction and compromise, and partakes more of the air of a military dictator than the head of a peaceful republic. The border state men denounce Davis and his bombast without stint. This recording is in the public domain. The Inauguration of Abraham Lincoln from the Farmer's Cabinet Friday, March the 8th, 1861 Read for LibriVox.org by Karen Savage Washington, March 4th The day was ushered in by a most exciting session of the Senate, that body sitting for twelve hours, from seven o'clock yesterday evening to seven o'clock this morning. As the hands of the clock pointed to twelve o'clock last night, and the Sabbath gave way to Monday the 4th of March, the Senate chamber presented a curious and animated appearance. The galleries were crowded to repletion, the ladies' gallery resembling, from the gay dresses of the fair ones there congregated, some gorgeous parterre of flowers, and the gentlemen's gallery seemed one dense, black mass of surging, heaving masculines, pushing, struggling, and almost clambering over each other's backs in order to get a good look at the proceedings. Some most ludicrous scenes were the result of the intense desire of the outsiders to get a peep into the Senate chamber, and the pertinacity with which the applicant for admission to the overflowing galleries would urge that he had come all the way from Indiana or Varmont, or some other place, afforded the seated ones intense amusement. On the floor, Messrs. Crittenden, Trumbull, Wigfall, Wade, Douglas, and others, kept up a rolling fire of debate, while those not engaged in the discussion betook themselves to the sofas for a comfortable nap during the session, which it was known would last all night. As the morning advanced, the galleries and floor became gradually cleared out, when in the grey morning light the Senate took a recess till ten o'clock to-day. A few minutes after seven o'clock, but few remained. The morning broke clear and beautiful, and though at one time a few drops of rain fell, the day proved just calm and cloudy enough to prevent the usual heat of the past few days, and the whirlwind of dust that would otherwise render it excessively unpleasant. The public buildings, schools, places of business, etc., were closed throughout the day. The stars and stripes floated from the City Hall, Capitol, War Department, and other public buildings, while not a few of the citizens flung out flags from their houses or across the principal avenues. From early dawn the drum and fife could be heard in every quarter of the city, and the streets were thronged with volunteer soldiers hastening to their respective rendezvous. Three or four hours elapsed before there was the least chance of entering the capital. Pennsylvania Avenue was thronged with people wending their way to the famous East Front. For four hours the crowd poured on toward the capital in one continuous stream of old and young, male and female, staid old Quakers from Pennsylvania going to see Friend Abraham, and lengthy suckers, Hoosiers, and Wolverines desirous of a peep at Mr. Lincoln, Buckeyes and Yankees, men from the Northeast and the Northwest, and a few from the border states. The large majority, however, were northern men, there being but few southerners, judging from the lack of long-haired men in the crowd. The order of arrangements, as settled by the Committee of Arrangements, was as follows. To the left of the Vice-President were the Committee of Arrangements, immediately behind them the heads of the various departments of the government, senators and members-elect of the House of Representatives, officers of the Army and Navy, governors of the states and territories, comptrollers, auditors, registers, and solicitors of the Treasury. To the right of the Vice-President were the judges of the Supreme Court, senators, diplomatic corps, ex-governors of states, assistant secretaries of departments, commissioners, judges, and mayors of Georgetown and Washington. 
Previous to the arrival of the procession, the Senate chamber did not present a very animated appearance. The many ladies waiting to see the display did not arrive till late, and the officers whose gay uniforms and flashing epaulettes relieved so well the sombreness of the national black were with the presidential cortege during the passing of the procession to Willard's Hotel and the march thence to the Capitol. Senator Bright killed in the most approved manner a certain gas bill, to wit, by talking it to death. This not proving very interesting, matters waxed somewhat dull in the interim. At five minutes to twelve o'clock, Vice President Breckinridge and Senator Foote of the Committee of Arrangements entered the Senate chamber, escorting the Vice President elect, Honorable Hannibal Hamlin, whom they conducted to a seat immediately to the left of the chair of the President of the Senate. As the hands of the clock pointed to the hour of twelve, the hammer fell, and the second session of the thirty sixth Congress came to an end. Vice President Breckinridge bid the Senate farewell, and then administered the oath of office to Vice President Hamlin. This ceremony is described in the Senate report. Mr. Breckinridge then announced the Senate adjourned without day, and left the chair, to which he immediately conducted Vice President Hamlin. Honorable Mr. Clingman was then sworn in as Senator from the State of North Carolina, Messrs. Clark for New Hampshire, Chase for Ohio, Harris of New York, Harlan for Iowa, Howe for Wisconsin, Breckinridge for Kentucky, Lane for Indiana, Nesmith for Oregon, and Mitchell for Arkansas. At this juncture, the members and members elect of the House of Representatives entered the Senate chamber, filling every available place to the left of the Vice President. The Foreign Diplomatic Corps also entered the chamber at the same moment, occupying seats to the right of the chair. It was a subject of general remark that the Foreign Corps never was so fully represented as on this occasion. The ministers, attachés, and others numbered in all some fifty and over, and their brilliancy of dress, the number of their decorations, crapes, etc., added much to the imposing nature of the scene. Some of the court uniforms were particularly gorgeous, and attracted much attention. The scene in the Senate, while waiting the arrival of the presidential party, seemed to realize the lying down of the lamb and the lion together, or the mingling of oil and water. Messrs. Chase, Wigfall, Crittenden, Wilson and others hobnobbing with the utmost cordiality. Senator Breckinridge was conversing familiarly with the extremist men of the Republicans, while ladies of all political affinities, Mrs. Hamlin among them, looked smilingly down upon the animated scene below. The attendance of senators was usually full, the only absences noticed being those of Messrs. Mason and Hunter of Virginia. At fifteen minutes to one o'clock, the judges of the Supreme Court of the United States of America were announced by the doorkeeper of the Senate. On their entrance, all on the floor arose, and the venerable judges, headed by the Chief Justice Taney, moved slowly to the seats assigned them, immediately to the right of the Vice President, each exchanging salutes with that officer in passing the chair. At ten minutes after one o'clock, an unusual stir occurred in the chamber, and the rumor spread like wildfire that the President-elect was in the building. At fifteen minutes past one o'clock, the Marshal and Chief Major B. B. French entered the chamber, ushering in the President and the President-elect. They had entered together from the street through a private covered passageway on the north side of the Capitol, police officers being in attendance to prevent outsiders from crowding after them. The line of procession was then formed in the following manner. Marshal of the District of Columbia, Judges of Supreme Court and Sergeant-at-Arms, Senate Committee of Arrangements, President of the United States and President-elect, Vice President, Secretary of the Senate, Senators, Diplomatic Corps, Heads of the Departments, Governors, and others in the Chamber. When the word was given for members of the House to fall into the line of procession, a violent rush was made for the door, accompanied by loud outcries, violent pushing, and great disturbance. After the procession had reached the platform, Senator Baker of Oregon introduced Mr. Lincoln to the Assembly. On Mr. Lincoln advancing to the stand, he was cheered, but not very loudly. Unfolding his manuscript, in a loud, clear voice, he read his message as follows. President Lincoln's Inaugural Address Fellow citizens of the United States, In compliance with a custom as old as the government itself, I appear before you to address you briefly, and to take in your presence the oath prescribed by the Constitution of the United States, to be taken by the President before he enters upon the duties of his office. I do not consider it necessary at present for me to discuss those matters of administration about which there is no special anxiety or excitement. Apprehension seems to exist among the people of the southern states that by the accession of a republican administration their property and their 
permanent peace and security are to be endangered. There has never been any reasonable cause for such apprehension. Indeed, the most ample evidence to the contrary has all the while existed and been open to their inspection. It is found in nearly all the published speeches of him who now addresses you. I do but quote from one of these speeches when I declare that I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. Those who nominated and elected me did so with full knowledge that I had made this and many similar declarations, and had never recanted them, and, more than this, they placed in the platform for my acceptance, and as a law to themselves and to me, the clear and emphatic resolution which I now read. Resolved that the maintenance inviolate of the rights of the States, and especially the right of each according to its own judgment exclusively, is essential to that balance of power on which the perfection and endurance of our political fabric depend, and we denounce the lawless invasion by an armed force of any State or territory, no matter under what pretext, as the greatest of crimes. I now reiterate these sentiments, and in doing so, I only press upon the public attention the most conclusive evidence of which the case is susceptible, that the property, peace, and security of no section are to be in any wise endangered by the now incoming administration. Add to that, all the protection which consistently with the Constitution and the laws can be given, will be cheerfully given to all States when lawfully demanded, for whatever cause as cheerfully to one section as to another. There is much controversy about delivering up fugitives from service or labor. The clause I now read is as plainly written in the Constitution as any other of its provisions. No person held to service or labor in one state under the laws thereof, escaping into another, shall in consequence of any law or regulation therein be discharged from such service or labor, but shall be delivered up on a claim of the party to whom such service or labor may be due. It is scarcely questioned that this provision was intended by those who made it for the reclaiming of what we call fugitive slaves, and the intention of the lawgiver as the law. All members of Congress swear their support to the whole Constitution, to this provision as much to any other, to the proposition, then, that slaves, whose cases come within the terms of this clause, shall be delivered up. Their oaths are unanimous. Now, if they would make the effort in good temper, could they not with nearly equal unanimity frame and pass a law by means of which to keep good that unanimous oath? There is some difference of opinion, whether this clause should be enforced by national or by state authority, but surely that difference is not a very material one. If the slave is to be surrendered, it can be of but little consequence to him or to others by which authority it is done, and should any one in any case be content that his oath should be unkept on a merely substantial controversy as to how it shall be kept? Again, in any law upon this subject, ought not all the safeguards of liberty known in civilized and humane jurisprudence to be introduced so that a free man be not in any case surrendered as a slave, and might it not be well at the same time to provide by law for the enforcement of that clause in the Constitution, which guarantees that the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens of the several states? I take the official oath to-day with no mental reservations and with no purpose to construe the Constitution or the laws by any hypocritical rules, and while I do not choose now to specify particular acts of Congress as proper to be enforced, I do suggest that it will be much safer for all, both in official and private stations, to conform to and abide by all those acts which stand unrepealed than to violate any of them, trusting to find impunity in having them held to be unconstitutional. It is seventy-two years since the first inauguration of a president under our national constitution. During that period, fifteen different and greatly distinguished citizens have in succession administered the executive branch of the government. They have conducted it through many perils, and generally with great success. Yet with all this scope of precedent, I now enter upon the same task for the brief constitutional term of four years, under great and peculiar difficulties. A disruption of the Federal Union, heretofore only menaced, is now formidably attempted. I hold that in contemplation of universal law, and of the Constitution, the union of these states is perpetual. Perpetuity is implied, if not expressed, in the fundamental law of all national governments. It is safe to assert that no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination continue to execute all the express provisions of our national constitution, and the Union will endure forever. 
it being impossible to destroy it except by some action not provided for in the instrument itself. Again, if the United States be not a government proper, but an association of states in the name of a contract merely, can it as a contract be peacefully unmade by less than all the parties who made it? One party to a contract may violate or break it, so to speak, but does it not require all to lawfully rescind it? Descending from these general principles, we find the proposition that in legal contemplation the Union is perpetual, confirmed by the history of the Union itself. The Union is much older than the Constitution. It was formed, in fact, by the Articles of Association in 1774. It was matured and continued by the Declaration of Independence in 1776. It was further matured, and the faith of all the then thirteen states expressly plighted and engaged that it should be perpetual by the Articles of Confederation in 1778, and finally in 1787. One of the declared objects for ordaining and establishing the Constitution was to form a more perfect union. But if destruction of the union by one or part only of the states be lawfully possible, the union is less than before the Constitution, having lost the vital element of perpetuity. It follows from these views that no state upon its own mere motion can lawfully get out of the union, that resolves and ordinances to that effect are legally void, and that acts of violence within any state or states against the authority of the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary according to circumstances. I therefore consider that in view of the Constitution and the laws, the Union is unbroken, and to the extent of my ability, I shall take care, as the Constitution itself expressly enforces upon me, that the laws of the United States be faithfully executed in all the States. Doing this I deem to be only a simple duty on my part, and I shall perform it so far as practicable, unless my rightful masters, the American people, shall withhold the requisition, or in some authoritative manner direct the contrary. I trust this will not be regarded as a menace, but only as the declared purpose of the Union, that it will constitutionally defend and maintain itself. In doing this there needs to be no bloodshed or violence, and there shall be none, unless it be forced upon the national authority. The power confided to me will be used to hold, occupy, and possess the property and places belonging to the government, and collect the duties and imposts but beyond what may be necessary for these objects there will be no invasion, no using of force against or among the people anywhere. Where hostility to the United States in any interior territory shall be so great and so universal as to prevent the competent resident citizens from holding the federal offices, there will be no attempt to force obnoxious strangers among people that object. While the strict legal right may exist for the government to enforce the exercise of these offices, the attempt to do so would be so irritating, and so nearly impracticable withal, that I deem it better to forego for a time the use of such offices. The mails, unless repelled, will continue to be furnished in all parts of the Union so far as possible. The people everywhere shall have that sense of perfect security which is most favorable to calm thought and reflection. The course here indicated will be followed unless current events and experience shall show a modification or change to be proper, and in every case and exigency my best discretion will be exercised according to circumstances actually existing, and with a view and a hope to a peaceful solution of the national trouble, and the restoration of fraternal sympathies and affections. That there are persons in one section or another who seek to destroy the Union at all events, and are glad of any pretext to do so, I will neither affirm or deny. But if there should be such, I need address no word to them. To those, however, who really love the Union, may I not speak? Before entering upon so grave a matter as the destruction of our national fabric, with all its benefits, its memories, and its hopes, would it not be well to ascertain precisely why we do it? Will you hazard so desperate a step, while there is any possibility that any portion of the ills you fly from have no real existence? Will you, while the certain ills you fly to are greater than all the real ones you fly from? Will you risk the commission of such a fearful mistake? All protest to be content in the Union, if all constitutional rights can be maintained. Is it true, then, that any right plainly written in the Constitution has been denied? I think not. Happily the human mind is so constituted that no party can reach the audacity of doing this. Think, if you can, of a single instance in which a plainly written provision of the Constitution has ever been denied. 
If by mere force of numbers a majority should deprive a minority of any clearly written constitutional right, it might, in a moral point of view, justify revolution. It certainly would, if such right were a vital one. But such is not the case. All the vital rights of minorities and individuals are so plainly assured to them by affirmations and negatives, guarantees and prohibitions in the Constitution, that controversies never arise concerning them. But no organic law can ever be framed with a provision specifically applicable to every question which may occur in the practical administration. No foresight can anticipate, nor any document of reasonable length contain, express provisions for all possible questions. Shall fugitives from labor be surrendered by national or state authority? The Constitution does not expressly say. Must Congress protect slavery in the territories? The Constitution does not expressly say. From questions of this class spring all our constitutional controversies, and we divide upon them into majorities and minorities. If the minority will not acquiesce, the majority must, or the government will cease. There is no other alternative for continuing the government but acquiescence on the one side or the other. There is no other alternative for continuing the government but acquiescence on the one side or other. If a minority in such a case will secede rather than acquiesce, they make a precedent which in turn will divide and ruin them, for a minority of their own will secede from them whenever a majority refuses to be controlled by such minority. For instance, why may not a portion of a new confederacy, a year or two hence, arbitrarily secede again, precisely as a portion of the present union now claims to secede from it? All who cherish disunion sentiments are now being educated to the exact temper of doing this. Is there such perfect identity of interests among the states to compose a new union as to produce harmony only and prevent renewed secession? Plainly, the central idea of secession is the essence of anarchy. A majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations, and always changing easily with the deliberate changes of popular opinion and sentiment, is the only true sovereign of a free people. Whoever rejects it does of necessity fly to anarchy or to despotism. Unanimity is impossible. The rule of a minority as a permanent arrangement is wholly inadmissible, so that rejecting the majority principle, anarchy or despotism in some form, is all that is left. I do not forget the position assumed by some, that constitutional questions are to be decided by the Supreme Court, nor do I deny that such decisions must be binding in any case upon the parties to a suit, as to the object of that suit, while they are also entitled to very high respect and considerations in all parallel cases by all other departments of the government. And while it is obviously possible that such decision may be erroneous in any given case, still the evil effect following it being limited to that particular case, with the chance that it may become a precedent for other cases, can better be borne than could the evils of a different practice. At the same time, the candid citizen must confess that if the policy of the government upon vital questions affecting the whole people is to be irrevocably fixed by the decisions of the Supreme Court, the instant they are made in ordinary litigation between parties and personal actions, the people will have ceased to be their own rulers, having to that extent practically resigned their government into the hands of that eminent tribunal. Nor is there in this view any assault upon the court or the judges. It is a duty from which they may not shrink, to decide cases properly brought before them, and it is no fault of theirs if others seek to turn their decisions to political purposes. One section of our country believes slavery is right and ought to be extended, while the other believes it is wrong and ought not to be extended. This is the only substantial dispute. The fugitive slave clause of the Constitution and the law for the suppression of the foreign slave trade are each as well enforced, perhaps, as any laws can be in a community where the moral sense of the people imperfectly supports the law itself. The great body of the people abide by the dry legal obligation in both cases, and a few break over in each. This, I think, cannot be perfectly cured, and it would be worse in both cases after a separation of the sections than before. The foreign slave trade, now imperfectly suppressed, would be ultimately revived without restriction in one section, while fugitive slaves, now only partially surrendered, would not be surrendered at all by the other. Physically speaking, we cannot separate. We cannot remove our respective sections from each other, nor build an impassable wall between them. A husband and wife may be divorced and go out of the presence and reach of each other, but the different parts of our country cannot do this. They cannot but remain face to face, and intercourse, either amicable or hostile relations, must continue between them. 
Is it possible, then, to make that intercourse more advantageous or more satisfactory after separation than before? Can aliens make treaties easier than friends can make laws? Can treaties be more faithfully enforced between aliens than law can among friends? Suppose you go to war, you cannot fight always, and when, after much loss on both sides and no gain on either, you cease fighting, the identical questions as to terms of intercourse are again upon you. This country, with its institutions, belongs to those who inhabit it. Whenever they grow weary of the existing government, they can exercise their constitutional right of amending or their revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it. I cannot be ignorant of the fact that many worthy and patriotic citizens are desirous of having the national constitution amended. While I make no recommendation of amendment, I fully recognize the authority of the people over the whole subject to be exercised in either of the modes prescribed in the instrument itself, and I should, under existing circumstances, favor rather than oppose a fair opportunity being afforded the people to act upon it. I will venture to add that to me the convention mode seems preferable, in that it allows amendments to originate with the people themselves, instead of only permitting them to take a proposition originated by others, not especially chosen for the purpose, and which might not be precisely such as they wished to either accept or refuse. I understand a proposed amendment to the Constitution, which amendment I have not seen, has passed Congress to the effect that the Federal Government shall never interfere with the domestic institutions of the States, including that of persons held to service. To avoid misconstruction of what I have said, I now depart from my purpose, not to speak of particular amendments, so far as to say that, holding such a provision to now be implied constitutional law, I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. The Chief Magistrate derives all his authority from the people, and they have conferred none upon him to fix terms for the separation of the States. The people themselves can do this alone, if they choose, but the executive as such has nothing to do with it. His duty is to administer the present government as it came to his hands, and to transmit it unimpaired by him to his successor. Why should there not be a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people? Is there any better or equal hope in the world in our present differences? Is either party without faith of being in the right? If the Almighty Ruler of Nations will, with His eternal truth and justice, be on your side of the North, or on yours of the South, that truth and that justice will surely prevail by the judgment of this great tribunal, the American people. By the frame of the government under which we live, the same people have wisely given their public servants but little power for mischief, and have with equal wisdom provided for the return of that little to their own hands at intervals. While the people retain virtue and vigilance, no administration of any extreme of wickedness or folly can very seriously impair the government in the short space of four years. My countrymen, one and all, think calmly and well upon the whole subject. Nothing valuable can be lost by taking time. If there be an object to hurry any of you in hot haste to a step which you would never take deliberately, that object will be frustrated by taking time. But no good object can be frustrated by it. Such of you as are now dissatisfied still have the old Constitution unimpaired, and on the sensitive point the laws of your own framing under it, while the new administration have no immediate power, if it would, to change either. If it were admitted that you, who are dissatisfied, hold the right side in the dispute, there still is no single good reason for precipitate action. I am loath to close. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bands of affection. The mystic call of memory, stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone, all over this broad land, will yet swell the chorus of the Union when again touched, as surely they will be by the better angels of our nature. Intelligence, patriotism, Christianity, and a firm reliance on him who has never yet forsaken this favoured land, are still competent to adjust in the best way all our present difficulties. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, and not in mine, is the momentous issue of civil war. The government will not assail you. You can have no conflict without yourselves being the aggressors. You have no oath registered in heaven to destroy the government, while I shall have the most solemn one to preserve, protect, and defend it. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. From Washington, Abolition of Slavery From the New York Times, February 1st, 1865 
Read for LibriVox.org by Betsy Bush. Passage of the Constitutional Amendment, 119 yeas against 56 nays. Exciting scene in the House. Enthusiasm over the result. Washington, Tuesday, January 31st. The Passage of the Constitutional Amendment. The great feature of the existing rebellion was the passage today by the House of Representatives of the resolutions submitting to the legislatures of the several states an amendment to the Constitution abolishing slavery. It was an epoch in the history of the country, and will be remembered by the members of the House and spectators present as an event in their lives. At three o'clock, by general consent, all discussion having ceased, the preliminary votes to reconsider and second the demand for the previous question were agreed to by a vote of 113 yeas to 58 nays. And amid profound silence, the Speaker announced that the yeas and nays would be taken directly upon the pending proposition. During the call, when prominent Democrats voted aye, there was suppressed evidence of applause and gratification exhibited in the galleries but it was evident that the great interest centered entirely upon the final result, and when the presiding officer announced that the resolution was agreed to by yeas 119, nays 56, the enthusiasm of all present, save a few disappointed politicians, knew no bounds, and for several moments the scene was grand and impressive beyond description. No attempt was made to suppress the applause which came from all sides, everyone feeling that the occasion justified the fullest expression of approbation and joy. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. A Terribly Brutal Murder in Whitechapel From the New York Times, dated September 1, 1888 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett London Crime and Gossip A Terribly Brutal Murder in Whitechapel From Our Own Correspondent London, August 31st A strangely horrible murder took place at Whitechapel this morning. The victim was a woman who at three o'clock was knocked down by some man unknown and attacked with a knife. She attempted to escape and ran a hundred yards, her cries for help being heard by several persons in adjacent houses. No attention was paid to her cries, however, and when found at daybreak she was lying dead in another street several hundred yards from the scene of the attack. Her head was nearly severed from her body, which was literally cut to pieces, one gash reaching from the pelvis to the breastbone. The strangest part of the affair is that this is the third murder of the kind which has been done lately. In the last one, two weeks ago, the victim was stabbed 39 times. In the case before it, some months ago, the victim was stabbed with a stick which was forced through the body. All three victims have been women of the lowest class. All three murders have taken place in the same district at about the same hour and have been characterized by the same inhuman and ghoul-like brutality. The police have concluded that the same man did all three murders and that the most dangerous kind of a lunatic is at large. The excitement is intense over the matter and the women in Whitechapel are afraid to stir out of their doors unprotected after dark. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Whitechapel Startled by a Fourth Murder From the New York Times Dated September 9, 1888 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett Old World News by Cable Whitechapel Startled by a Fourth Murder From Our Own Correspondent London, September 8th Not even during the riots and fog of February 1886 Have I seen London so thoroughly excited as it is tonight the Whitechapel fiend murdered his fourth victim this morning and still continues undetected, unseen, and unknown. There is a panic in Whitechapel, which will instantly extend to other districts should he change his locality, as the four murders are in everybody's mouth. The papers are full of them, and nothing else is talked of. The latest murder is exactly like its predecessor. The victim was a woman streetwalker of the lowest class. She had no money, having been refused lodgings shortly before because she lacked eight pence. Her throat was cut so completely that everything but the spine was severed, and the body was ripped up, all the viscera being scattered about. The murder in all its details was inhuman to the last degree, and, like the others, could have been the work only of a bloodthirsty beast in human shape. It was committed in the most daring manner possible. The victim was found in the backyard of a house in Hanbury Street at six o'clock. At 5.15, the yard was empty. 
To get there, the murderer must have led her through a passageway in the house full of sleeping people and murdered her within a few yards of several people sleeping by open windows. To get away, covered with blood as he must have been, he had to go back through the passageway and into a street filled with early market people, Spitalfields being close by. Nevertheless, not a sound was heard and no trace of the murderer exists. All day long, Whitechapel has been wild with excitement. The four murders have been committed within a gunshot of each other, but the detectives have no clue. The London police and detective force is probably the stupidest in the world. The man called Leather Apron, of whom I cabled you, is still at large. He is well known, but they have not been able to arrest him, and he will doubtless do another murder in a day or so. One clue discovered this morning by a reporter may develop into something. An hour and a half after the murder, a man with bloody hands, torn shirt, and a wild look entered a public house half a mile from the scene of the murder. The police have a good description of him and are trying to trace it. The assassin, however, is as cunning as he is daring. Both in this and in the last murder, he took but a few minutes to murder his victim in a spot which had been examined but a quarter of an hour before. Both the character of the deed and the cool cunning alike exhibit the qualities of a monomaniac. Such a series of murders has not been known in London for a hundred years. There is a bare possibility that it may turn out to be something like a case of Jekyll and Hyde, as Joseph Taylor, a perfectly reliable man who saw the suspected person this morning in a shabby dress, swears that he has seen the same man coming out of a lodging house in Wilton Street, very differently dressed. However that may be, the murders are certainly the most ghastly and mysterious known to English police history. What adds to the weird effect they exert on the London mind is the fact that they occur while everybody is talking about Mansfield's Jekyll and Hyde at the Lyceum. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Dismay in Whitechapel from the New York Times, October 1st, 1888. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Dismay in Whitechapel. Two more murdered women found from our own correspondent. London, September 30th. The Whitechapel fiend has again set that district and all London in a state of terror. He murdered not one woman, but two last night, and seems bent on beating all previous records in his unheard-of crimes. His last night's victims were both murdered within an hour, and the second was disemboweled like her predecessors, a portion of her abdomen being missing as in the last case. He contented himself with cutting the throat of the other, doubtless because of interruption. Both women were streetwalkers of the lowest class, as before. These crimes are all of the most daring character. The first woman was killed in the open roadway within a few feet of the main street, and though many people were within a few feet distance, no cry was heard. This was at midnight. Before one o'clock, the second victim was found, and she was so warm that the murder must have taken place but a few minutes before. This was in Mitre Square, which is but a few blocks distant from the Bank of England in the very heart of the business quarter. The square is deserted at night, but is patrolled every half hour at least by the police. These make six murders to the fiend's credit, all within a half mile radius. People are terrified and are loud in their complaints of the police who have done absolutely nothing. They confess themselves without a clue, and they devote their entire energies to preventing the press from getting at the facts. They deny to reporters a sight of the scene or bodies, and give them no information whatever. The assassin is evidently mocking the police in his barbarous work. He waited until the two preceding inquests were quite finished, and then murdered two more women. He has promised to murder twenty in all, and has every prospect of uninterrupted success. Also, as London Press dispatches, London, September 30th. This morning the whole city was again startled by the news that two more murders had been added to the list of mysterious crimes that have recently been committed in Whitechapel. At an early hour it was known that another victim had been murdered, and a report was also current that there was still another victim. This report proved true. The two victims, as in the former cases, were dissolute women of the poorest class. That the motive of the murderer was not robbery is shown by the fact that no attempt was made to despoil the bodies. The first murder occurred in a narrow court off Burner Street at an early hour in the morning between the windows of a foreigner socialist club. A concert was in progress and many members of the club were present, but no sound was heard from the victim. The same process had been followed as in the other cases. The woman had been seized by the throat and her cries choked, and the murderer, with one sweeping cut, had severed her throat from ear to ear. A clubman, on entering the court, stumbled over the body, which was lying only two yards from the street. 
A stream of warm blood was flowing from the body into the gutter. The murderer had evidently been disturbed before he had time to mutilate his victim. The second murder was committed from three to four hours later in Mitre Square, five minutes' walk from the scene of the first crime. Policemen patrol the square every ten minutes. The body of the unfortunate woman had been disemboweled, the throat cut, and the head severed. The heart and lungs had been thrown aside, and the entrails were twisted into the gaping wound around the neck. The incisions show a rough dexterity. The work of dissection was evidently done with the utmost haste. Pending the report of the doctors, it is not known whether or not a portion of the viscera was taken away. The doctors, after a hasty examination of the body, said they thought it must have taken about five minutes to complete the work of the murderer, who then had plenty of time to escape the patrol. Mitre Square, the scene of the second murder, is a thoroughfare. Many people pass through the square early on Sunday morning on their way to prepare for market in the notorious Petticoat Lane. The publicity of the place adds to the daringness of the crime. The police, who have been severely criticized in connection with the Whitechapel murders, are paralyzed by these latest crimes. As soon as the news was received at police headquarters, a messenger was dispatched for Sir Charles Warren, Chief Commissioner of Police, who was called out of bed and at once visited the scene of the murders. The inhabitants of Whitechapel are dismayed. The vigilance committees which were formed after the first crimes were committed had relaxed their efforts to capture the murderer. At several meetings held in Whitechapel tonight, it was resolved to resume the work of patrolling the streets in the district in which the murders have occurred. The Burner Street victim was Elizabeth Stride, a native of Stockholm who resided in a common lodging house. The name of the other victim is not known. In consequence of the refusal of Home Secretary Matthews to offer a reward for the arrest of the Whitechapel murderer, the people of the East End on Saturday petitioned the Queen herself to authorize the offering of a reward. Dr. Blackwell, who was called to view the remains of the Burner Street victim, gave it as his opinion that the same man, evidently a maniac, had committed both murders. The Burner Street victim had evidently been dragged back by a handkerchief worn around the throat. The inquest will be held at 11 o'clock Monday morning. Four doctors will be on the jury. The inquest on the Mitre Square victim will probably be held on Tuesday. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The Whitechapel Murderer Still Untracked From the New York Times, October 2, 1888 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett London's Awful Mystery, The Whitechapel Murderer Still Untracked From Our Own Correspondent London, October 1st Excitement over the Whitechapel murders has steadily increased during the day, the evening papers devoting all available space to the gory details. As in the preceding cases, however, the murderer continues unknown and unsuspected. The Burner Street victim has been identified as Elizabeth Stride, alias Long Liz, a widow. The other is still unknown, but is believed to be a streetwalker known as May. Her face is so badly cut that it is difficult to recognize her. The coroner has begun an inquest on the first woman. As before, in all these horrible crimes, the duty of investigation seems to devolve on the coroner, and the detectives sit at the inquest listening to the sworn testimony to find out who did it. The whole police management of the cases, as indeed the system under which they work, is idiotic in the extreme. Indignation meetings were held in several places in Whitechapel today to denounce Sir Charles Warren and Home Secretary Matthews. The Daily Telegraph this morning called loudly for Matthews's dismissal since he had not sense enough to resign. A petition to the Queen is in preparation, asking her to offer a reward, Matthews having stupidly refused. The Lord Mayor promptly offered five hundred pounds reward this morning, the second murder having been committed within the precincts of the city. This, with other private rewards, makes a total of one thousand two hundred pounds. There are any amount of theories published, some scientific, others ingenious, and others stupid. There are plenty of clues also, but they are slight and show no signs of developing the murderer. The only trace considered of any value is the story of a watchboy who saw a man and woman leave Aldgate Station going towards Mitre Square. The man returned shortly afterward alone. The police have a good description of him. The daring character of the murders is evident from the fact that two people at least saw a man and the woman together in the Burner Street gateway and one saw him throw her down. He went away and left her there, but it was half an hour before it was known that she had been murdered. In the second case, a policeman swears that he was not absent over 15 minutes from Mitre Square and must have been watched by both man and woman as he went through, they following. 
The police confess tonight that they have no clues. A number of men have been arrested, but all were released. There is every prospect at present that these murders, like their predecessors, will pass undetected. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Another Mysterious Murder Brought to Light From the New York Times, October 3, 1888 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett London's Record of Crime Another Mysterious Murder Brought to Light From Our Own Correspondent London, October 2nd the carnival of blood continues, it is an extremely strange state of affairs altogether, because before the Whitechapel murders began, several papers called attention to the fact that there had been more sanguinary crimes committed in London and its vicinity this summer than ever before known in this city in the same space of time. The Whitechapel assassin has now murdered six victims, and crimes occur daily, but pass unnoticed in view of the master murderer's work in the East End. Last Friday, a man in Pimlico sharpened a knife in the presence of his wife, threatening her all the time, and then cut off her head with it. This rather dramatic crime passed off without particular notice, the papers giving it only a brief paragraph. This afternoon, however, a discovery was made which was even more horrible than any of the recent deeds. A few days ago, the right arm of a woman was found by some boys in the Thames near Waterloo Bridge. It belonged to a young woman, was plump, shapely, and graceful, and had been rudely hacked from the shoulder. It was believed at first to be evidence of another murder, but as no young woman had been murdered so far as known, the theory that it was a specimen from a dissecting room was generally adopted. The police took immediate possession of it and refused absolutely either to give any information concerning its appearance or to say whether it pointed to a fresh crime. The boys who found it said it was a well-preserved human arm, but scarred and excoriated in many places, as if from the action of quick lime. The police refused to say yes or no to this, but hinted or said that it was all a mistake and that the thing found was merely the old skeleton of an arm with no flesh on it. This afternoon, however, a discovery was made in Pimlico, a mile up the river from where the arm was found, which throws some light on the mystery. There are some old buildings on the embankment, close to the Parliament Houses and almost in the shadow of Westminster Abbey, and workmen are engaged in tearing these down to prepare a site for the new police station. As they destroyed an old vault today, they came upon a shapeless mass, which upon closer inspection proved to be the trunk of the body of a young woman, perhaps thirty years old. The horribly mutilated head, arms, and legs have been cut off and carried away, only the trunk being left. The body was not ripped, however, as in the Whitechapel cases. It was very much decomposed, and in fact must have been there many weeks. The police removed it to a mortuary, and tomorrow morning the doctors will adjust the arms beside it to see if they fit. It is now admitted by the police that the second arm found matched the first one. Should the arms belong to the body, they may serve as a clue. They seem in a much better state of preservation than the body, however, and should they not fit, they will stand as evidence of a second horrible crime yet unrevealed. There is no clue to the identity of the murdered woman. In fact, so many people disappear daily in this great city that the record of disappearances will not be of much assistance. This crime, single or double as it may be, has no connection with the Whitechapel murders. Its method is different in every possible respect, and should it prove to be two murders instead of one, it will show an independent operation of the Whitechapel nature. Pimlico is two miles from Whitechapel. The master murderer of the latter district has done all his work in one small area, and there is no clue whatever to him. Tonight, a crazy man, with blood stains on his coat, who was flourishing surgical knives and making a general spectacle of himself in Milk Street in the city, was arrested, but he proves to be innocent. Another suspect was arrested in Chingford, Ifling Forest, today, but he easily proved an alibi. No one suspected is at present in custody, though all Scotland Yard is at work on the case. Also, Associated Press Dispatch, London, October 2nd. An inquest was held today on the body of the woman found murdered in a narrow court off Berners Street Sunday morning. A sister of the victim was called and deposed that she was awoke at 1.20 o'clock Sunday morning and heard a sound which she thought was made by a person falling to the ground. She was convinced that her sister was dead and after reading the accounts of the murder in the newspapers went to the morgue and recognized the body of the murdered woman as that of her sister. The house in which the witness resides is several miles from Berner Street. The murder is believed to have been committed at about 12.50 o'clock Sunday morning. End of article. This recording is in the public domain.
The Whitechapel Murders, from the New York Times, October 5, 1888, recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. The Whitechapel Murders, London, October 4. The British Medical Journal, referring to the Whitechapel Murders, says, The coroner's theory that the assassin's work was carried out under the impulse of a pseudo-scientific mania has been exploded by the first attempt at serious investigation. It is true that a foreign physician inquired a year ago as to the possibility of securing certain parts of the body for the purpose of scientific investigation, but no large sum was offered, and the physician in question is of the highest respectability and came exceedingly well accredited. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The Murders in London from the New York Times, October 6, 1888. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. The Murders in London. London, October 5th. Sir Charles Warren, Chief of the Metropolitan Police Force, has decided to employ bloodhounds in his efforts to discover the perpetrator of the Whitechapel murders. The police place confidence in the story of George M. Dodge, a seaman who states that in August last he met a Malay cook named Alaska, with whom he had previously been acquainted on shipboard in a music hall in London, and that Alaska told him he had been robbed of all he had by a woman of the town, and threatened that unless he found the woman and recovered his property, he would kill and mutilate every Whitechapel woman he met. The police are searching everywhere for the Malay. Acting on information which has been furnished them, the police have seized and occupied several houses in that section. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The Parnell Inquiry and Another Butchery From the New York Times, November 10, 1888 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett Exciting London Events the Parnell Inquiry and Another Butchery, by commercial cable from our own correspondent. London, November 9th. From today's proceedings of the Parnell Commission, it seems likely that the inquiry hereafter will go on in a cloud of sparks knocked out by partisan conflict. The Irish members are deeply indignant at the persistent pro-Times rulings of Justice Hannon, and only less vexed with their English lawyers, who have so tamely accepted these rulings without protest. The mutterings against this supineness have finally grown so loud that Sir Charles Russell was today impelled to try a sharp fall with Justice Hannon. The incident was exciting at the time, but it is most interesting as presaging a partisan struggle from this out, with the great probability of somebody going to prison for contempt of court. The most eligible candidate for this distinction appears at present to be William O'Brien, who this week attacks the Commission in United Ireland as a one-sided fraud. The discovery today of the seventh Whitechapel murder, this time believed to have been committed in broad daylight and involving the most terrible wholesale mutilation it is possible to imagine, overshadows all other topics in the London mind tonight. Bloodhounds are out, but I am unable to learn at this hour that they have discovered anything. The conclusion is now universal that the assassin is a periodic lunatic who, unless detected at once, is likely to commit a fresh series of crimes within a few days before his frenzy passes away. Also, London, November 9th. At 11 o'clock this morning, the body of a woman cut into pieces was discovered in a house on Dorset Street, Spitalfields. The police are endeavoring to track the murderer with the aid of bloodhounds. The appearance of the body was frightful, and mutilation was even greater than in the previous cases. The head had been severed and placed beneath one of the arms. The ears and nose had been cut off. The body had been disemboweled and the flesh was torn from the thighs. Some of the organs were missing. The skin had been torn off the forehead and cheeks. One hand had been pushed into the stomach. The victim, like all the others, was disreputable. She was married and her husband was a porter. They lived together at spasmodic intervals. Her name is believed to have been Lizzie Fisher, but to most of the habitués of the haunts she visited, she was known as Mary Jane. She had a room in the house where she was murdered. She carried a latch key, and no one knows at what hour she entered the house last night, and probably no one saw the man who accompanied her. Therefore, it is hardly likely that he will ever be identified. He might easily have left the house at any time between 1 and 6 o'clock this morning without attracting attention. The doctors who have examined the body refuse to make any statement until the inquest is held. Three bloodhounds belonging to private citizens were taken to the place and put on the scent of the murderer, but they were unable to keep it for any great distance, and all hope of running the assassin down with their assistance will have to be abandoned. 
The murdered woman told a companion last evening that she was without money and would commit suicide if she did not obtain a supply. It has been learned that a man, respectably dressed, accosted the victim and offered her money. They went to her lodgings on the second floor of the Dorset Street house. No noise was heard during the night, and nothing was known of the murder until the landlady went to the room early this morning to ask for her rent. The first thing she saw on entering the room were the woman's breasts and viscera lying on a table. Dorset Street is short and narrow and is situated close to Mitre Square and Hanbury Street. In the House of Commons today, Mr. Conabare asked the question whether, if it was true that another woman had been murdered in London, General Warren, the chief of the Metropolitan Police, ought not to be superseded by an officer accustomed to investigate crime. The question was greeted by cries of, Oh, oh. The Speaker called, Order, order, and said that notice must be given of the question in the usual way. Mr. Conabare replied, I have given private notice. The Speaker, the notice must be made in writing. Mr. Cunningham Graham then asked whether General Warren had already resigned, to which Mr. Smith, the government leader, replied no. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Sir Charles Warren resigns. From the New York Times, November 13, 1888. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Sir Charles Warren resigns. London, November 12th. General Sir Charles Warren, Chief of the Metropolitan Police, has tendered his resignation. It is understood that this action is due to the severe criticisms that have been made upon his efficiency recently in connection with the Whitechapel murders. In the House of Commons this afternoon, Mr. Matthews, the Home Secretary, announced the resignation of General Warren as Chief of the Metropolitan Police. The announcement was greeted with cheers. Mr. W. H. Smith, the government leader, said that an extra estimate would be presented to meet the expenses of the Parnell Commission. He also said that application had been made to the Irish government for access to certain documents, and that leave to examine these documents would be granted to the Council of both the Times and the Parnellites under certain conditions. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. His Arrest in London, Not His First Experience From the New York Times, November 19, 1888 Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett The Same Tumblety His Arrest in London, Not His First Experience The Dr. Tumblety, who was arrested in London a few days ago on suspicion of complicity in the Whitechapel murders, and who, when proved innocent of that charge, was held for trial in the Central Criminal Court under the special law covering the offenses disclosed in the late modern Babylon scandal, will be remembered by any number of Brooklynites and New Yorkers as Dr. Blackburn, the Indian herb doctor. He is the fellow who, in 1861, burst upon the people of Brooklyn as a sort of modern Count of Monte Cristo. He was of striking personal appearance, being considerably over six feet in height, of graceful and powerful build, with strong, marked features, beautifully clear complexion, a sweeping mustache, and jet black hair. He went dashing about the streets, mounted on a handsome light chestnut horse, and dressed in the costliest and most elaborate riding costumes, and soon had a stream of customers at his office and laboratory on Fulton Street near the City Hall. In these rides, he was invariably accompanied by a valet as handsomely apparelled in horses himself and a brace of superb English greyhounds. He boarded with the Mrs. Foster at 95 Fulton Street, then a fashionable quarter of the city, and cut a wide swath in the affections of the feminine lodgers. After a few months, he dropped out of sight as suddenly and as mysteriously as he had appeared and was next heard of as being implicated in the famous yellow fever importation and black bag plots that the rebel sympathizers tried to develop in New York during the Civil War. It was at this time that his relation to the celebrated Blackburn family of Kentucky became known, and he thereafter went by his real name instead of his curious assumed name, Tumblety. His interest in the two previously mentioned plots was, luckily for him, so slight that he was allowed to go unpunished, while several of his associates did not get off so easily. For several years after this, he kept pretty well out of the public gaze, and then suddenly took up his herb doctoring business with its attendant swagger again. He visited both this city and Brooklyn at about semi-yearly intervals and became a member of several questionable clubs. He dropped out of sight some ten years ago, and the first that has been heard of him since is the news of his arrest and imprisonment in London. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Whitechapel again excited. From the New York Times, November 22, 1888. 
Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Whitechapel again excited. London, November 21st. Great excitement was occasioned this morning when it was reported that another woman had been murdered and mutilated in Whitechapel. The police immediately formed a cordon around the premises, and an enormous crowd soon gathered. It was learned that another murder had been attempted upon a low woman by a man who had accompanied her to her lodging, but that in this instance his work had been frustrated. According to the woman's story, the man had seized her and struck her once in the throat with a knife. She had struggled desperately and had succeeded in freeing herself from the man's grasp and had screamed for help. Her cries had alarmed the man and he had fled without attempting any further violence. Some of the neighbors who had heard the woman's screams followed the murderer for about 300 yards when he disappeared from their sight. The woman says she is fully able to identify the man and gave a description of him to the police. The police are hopeful of soon capturing him. And later. Investigations by the police showed that the Whitechapel woman who reported this morning that she had been attacked by a man who went to her lodgings with her is of the lowest order. She suffered only a slight abrasion of the skin on her throat, and the police placed no credit in her story of an attack. They believe that she inflicted the injury herself while she was drunk. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Something about Dr. Tumblety. From the New York Times, November 23, 1888. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Leanne Howlett. Something about Dr. Tumblety. San Francisco, November 22nd. Chief of Police Crowley has lately been in correspondence with officials of Scotland Yard, London, regarding Dr. Tumblety, who is at present under arrest on suspicion of being implicated in the Whitechapel murders. The chief, in pursuing his investigations, discovered that the doctor still had quite a balance in the Hibernia Bank, which he left there when he disappeared from this city and which has never been drawn upon. Mr. Smythe of that institution says that he first met the doctor in Toronto, where he was practicing medicine in July 1858. He next met him in this city at the Occidental Hotel in March or April 1870. Tumblety rented an office at 20 Montgomery Street, where he remained until September 1870 and then disappeared as suddenly as he came. In 1871, the doctor turned up in New York. On October 29th, Chief Crowley sent a dispatch to the London detectives, informing them that he could furnish specimens of Tumblety's handwriting, and today he received an answer to send the papers at once. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. The New York Times, April 22, 1910. Front page. Mark Twain is dead at 74. Read for LibriVox.org by Esther. End comes peacefully at his New England home after a long illness. Conscious a little before. Carlyle's French Revolution lay beside him. Give me my glasses, his last words. Surviving child with him. Tragic death of his daughter, Jean, recently did much to hurry his end. Danbury, Connecticut, April 21, Samuel Longhorn Clemens, Mark Twain, died 22 minutes after six tonight. Beside him on the bed lay a beloved book. It was Carlyle's French Revolution. And near the book his glasses, pushed away with a weary sigh a few hours before. Too weak to speak clearly, give me my glasses, he had written on a piece of paper. He had received them, put them down, and sunk into unconsciousness, from which he glided almost imperceptibly into death. He was in his seventy-fifth year. For some time his daughter Clara and her husband, Ossip Kabrilowitz, and the humorous biographer, Albert Bigelow Payne, had been by the bed waiting for the end, which Dr. Quintard and Halsey had seen to be a matter of minutes. The patient felt absolutely no pain at the end, and the moment of his death was scarcely noticeable. Death came, however, while his favorite niece, Mrs. E. E. Looms, and her husband, who is vice-president of the Delaware, Lackawanna, and Amp, Western Railway, and a nephew, Jervis Langdon, were on the way to the railroad station. They had left the house much encouraged by the fact that the sick man had recognized them, and took a train for New York, ignorant of what happened later. Hopes aroused yesterday.
although the end had been foreseen by the doctors and would not have been a shock at any time the apparently strong rally of this morning had given basis for the hope that it would be postponed for several days mr clemens awoke at about four o'clock this morning after a few hours of the first natural sleep he had had for several days and the nurses could see by the brightness of his eyes that his vitality had been considerably restored he was able to raise his arms above his head and clasp them behind his neck with the first evidence of physical comfort he had given for a long time his strength seemed to increase enough to allow him to enjoy the sunrise the first signs of which he could see out of the windows in the three sides of the room where he lay the increasing sunlight seemed to bring ease to him and by the time the family was about he was strong enough to sit up in bed and overjoyed them by recognizing all of them and speaking a few words to each this was the first time that his mental powers had been fully his for nearly two days with the exception of a few minutes early last evening when he addressed a few sentences to his daughter calls for his book for two hours he lay in bed enjoying the feeling of this return of strength then he made a movement asked in a faint voice for a copy of carlyle's french revolution which he has always had near him for the last year and which he has read and re-read and brooded over the book was handed to him and he lifted it up as if to read then a smile faintly illuminated his face when he realized that he was trying to read without his glasses he tried to say give me my glasses but his voice failed and the nurses bending over him could not understand he motioned for a sheet of paper and a pencil and wrote what he could not say with his glasses on he read a little and then slowly put the book down with a sigh soon he appeared to become drowsy and settled on his pillow gradually he sank and settled into lethargy dr halsey appreciated that he could have been roused but considered it better for him to rest at three o'clock he went into complete unconsciousness later dr quintard who had arrived from new york held a consultation with dr halsey and it was decided that death was near the family was called and gathered about the bedside watching in a silence which was long unbroken it was the end at twenty-two minutes past six with the sunlight just turning red as it stole into the window in perfect silence he breathed his last died of a broken heart the people of reading bethel and danbury listened when they were told that the doctor said mark twain was dying of angina pectoris but they say among themselves that he died of a broken heart and this is a verdict not of popular sentiment alone albert bidgelow payne his biographer to be and literary executor who has been constantly with him said that for the last year at least mr clemens had been weary of life when richard watson gilder died he said how fortunate he is no good fortune of that kind ever comes to me the man who has stood to the public for the greatest humorous this country has produced has in private life suffered overwhelming sorrows the loss of an only son in infancy a daughter in her teens and one in middle life and finally of a wife who was a constant and sympathetic companion has preyed upon his mind the recent loss of his daughter jean who was closest to him in later years when her sister was abroad studying was the final blow on the heels of this came the first symptoms of the disease which was surely to be fatal and one of whose accompaniments is mental depression mr payne says that all heart went out of him and his work when his daughter jean died he has practically written nothing since he summoned his energies to write a last chapter memorial of her for his autobiography he told his biographer that the past winter in bermuda was gay but not happy bermuda is always gay in winter and mark twain was a central figure in the gaiety he was staying at the home of william h allen even in bermuda however mr clemens found himself unable to write and finally relied on mr allen's fifteen-year-old daughter helen to write the few letters he cared to send his health failed rapidly and finally mr allen wrote to albert bigelow payne that his friend was in a most serious condition mr payne immediately cabled to mrs brabelowitz his surviving daughter 
who was in Europe and started himself on April 2nd for Bermuda, embarking with the humorist for the return to New York immediately after his arrival. On the trip over, Mark Twain became very much worse and finally realized his condition. "'It's a losing game,' he said to his companion. "'I'll never get home alive.' Mr. Clemens did manage to summon his strength, however, and in spite of being so weak that he had to be carried down the gangplank, he survived the journey to his beautiful place at Reading. The first symptom of angina pectoris came last June, when he went to Baltimore to address a young ladies' school. In his room at the hotel he was suddenly taken with a terrible gripping at the heart. It soon passed away, however, and he was able to make an address with no inconvenience. The pains, however, soon returned with more frequency, and steadily grew worse until they became a constant torture. One of the last acts of Mark Twain was to write out a check for six thousand dollars for the library in which the literary coterie settled near Reading have been interested for a year. Fairs, musical, and sociables having been held in order to raise the necessary amount. The library is to be a memorial to Jean Clemens, and will be built on a site about half a mile from Stormfield at Cross Roads. It is certain to be recalled that Mark Twain was for more than fifty years an inveterate smoker, and the first conjecture of the layman would be that he had weakened his heart by overindulgence in tobacco. Dr. Housley said tonight that he was unable to say that the angina pectoris from which Mark Twain died was in any way related to nicotine poisoning. Some constitutions, he said, seem immune from the effects of tobacco, and his was one of them. Yet it is true that since his illness began, the doctors had cut down Mark Twain's daily allowance of twenty cigars and countless pipes to four cigars a day. No deprivation was a greater sorrow to him. He tried to smoke on the steamer while returning from Bermuda, and only gave it up because he was too feeble to draw on his pipe. Even on his deathbed, when past the point of speech, and it was no longer certain that his ideas were held, he would make the motion of waving a cigar, and smiling, expel empty air from under the moustache still stained with smoke. Where Mark Twain chose to spend his declining years was the first outpost of Methodism in New England, and it was among the hills of Reading that General Israel Putnam, of revolutionary fame, mustered his sparse ranks. Putnam Park now encloses the memory of his camp. Mark Twain first heard of it at the dipper given him on his seventeenth birthday, when a fellow guest who lived there mentioned its beauties and added that there was a vacant house adjoining his own. "'I think you may buy that old house for me,' said Mark Twain. Sherwood Place was the name of that old house, and where it stood Mark Twain reared the white walls of the Italian villa he first named Innocence at Home. But a first experience of what a New England winter storm can be in its whitest fury quickly caused him to christen it anew Stormfield.' where Mark Twain died. The house had been thus described by Albert Bigelow Payne, set on a fair hillside with such a green slope below, such a view outspread across the valley as made one catch his breath, a little when he first turned to look at it. A trout stream flows through one of the meadows. There are apple trees and grey stone walls. The entrance to it is a winding lane. Through this lane the innocent at home loved to wander in his white flannels for homely gossip with the neighbours. They remember him best as one who above all things loved a good listening. For Mark Twain was a mighty talker, stored with fairy tales for little maids he adored, and ruder speech for more masculine ears. It is a legend that he was vastly proud of his famous mop of white hair, and used to spend the pains of a court lady in getting it to just the proper stage of artistic disarray. The burial will be in the family plot at Elmira, New York, where lie already his wife, his two daughters, Susan and Jean, and his infant son, Langhorn. No date has yet been set, as the family is still undecided whether or not there should be a public funeral first in New York City. It is probable that Stormfield will be kept as a summer place by Mrs. Gabrielowitz, who is very fond both of the house and the country. 
although her husband's musical engagements make it necessary that she spend a part of each year abroad. Mr. Payne said tonight that Mark Twain had put his affairs in perfect order, and that he died well off, though by no means a rich man. He leaves a considerable number of manuscripts in all stages of incompleteness and of all characters, many of them begun years ago and put aside as unsatisfactory. Mrs. Gabrielowitz will aid Mr. Payne in the final decision as to what use shall be made of these. Mark Twain's Career Long Life, Struggles, and Achievements of Samuel Longhorn Clements Samuel Longhorn Clements was considered the best-known American man of letters. Often he was referred to as the Dean of American Literature. He was known far beyond the boundaries where English is spoken as the greatest humorous and satirist living. His famous telegram to a newspaper publishing a report of his death, when happily it was intrigue, has been quoted and requoted almost everywhere. The report of my death, he wired, is greatly exaggerated. The father of Mark Twain was John Marshall Clemens, who migrated from Virginia to Kentucky and then on to Adair County, Tennessee, when a young man. There he married a young woman named Langhorn, who brought him family prestige and many broad acres. But with the prevalent spirit of unrest among pioneers, the couple crossed over into Missouri, settling at Florida, Monroe County, where their famous son was born. Mark Twain's life, however, really did not begin until years later, when the family moved to Hannibal, Marion County. Hannibal has been described many times as a typical river town of that day, a sleepy place filled with drawling, lazy, picturesque inhabitants, black and white. Young Clemens, so the record runs, went to school there, and so also the record runs, studied just as little as he could, if he studied at all. He had been painted in that period of his career as an incorrigible truant, roaming the river banks and bluffs, watching the passing steamboats, and listening keenly to the trials that went on in the shabby office, where the justice of the peace, his father, settled the disputes and punished the misdemeanors of his neighbors. In that period, while the ambition to be a pilot on the great river burned in him, was stored in his memory the material which in after years crystallized into Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn, and Puddinhead Wilson. Mark Twain's school days ended when he was twelve. The father died, leaving nothing behind save the reputation of being a good neighbor and an upright man, and his children at once became breadwinners. Sam was apprenticed as a printer, at fifty cents a week in the office of the Hannibal Weekly Journal, doing, as he afterwards said, a little of everything. After three years with a capital, of a few dollars in his pocket, he became what was then a familiar sight, a wanderer from one printing office to another. About this period he paid his first visit to New York, having been drawn here by stories of a great exposition then in progress. He worked here for a while, then moved on to Philadelphia, and later, obeying always the wandering instinct which finally carried him around the world and into all hands, to nearly all the larger cities of the South and West, including New Orleans. The trip down the river awakened the old desire to be a pilot, which had slumbered since the Hannibal days, and his career as a printer was ended. He paid in cash and promised $5,000 to a Mississippi pilot to take him on as an assistant and teach him the river. He became a pilot and stuck to it until the outbreak of the Civil War, earning $250 a month. But chief of all, he got here his material for life on the Mississippi. His experience as a Confederate soldier was brief and inglorious. Hardly had he enlisted before he was captured, released on parole. He broke the parole and returned to the ranks and soon was recaptured. He was in imminent peril, for recognition meant immediate and ignominious execution. But he got away and determined never to take the risk again. He stopped flight only on reaching Nevada, where several letters of his to the Virginia City Enterprise resulted in an offer from the editor of that paper of a place on the staff. From that day forward, Clemens earned his living with his pen, 
but with the exception of several excursions. From Nevada, Mark Twain moved out to San Francisco, where, after a brief service on the local staff of The Call, he was discharged as useless. Then he and Bret Hart were associated in the conduct of The Californian, but both soon deserted the paper to make their fortunes mining if they could. Neither did, and Mark Twain was soon back in San Francisco, penniless and ill. This was in blank. The Sacramento Union sent him to Sandwich Islands to write a blank of letters on the sugar trade, an arrangement which this time he filled to the editor's satisfaction, and returned restored to health. That winter, however, was one of roughing it for him. He could get little to do as reporter or editor, and finally took to lecturing in a small way. He was a success from the start. He spoke in many of the small towns of California and Nevada, earning more than a living, and meantime writing sketches for eastern papers. These attracted considerable notice, and in March of 1867 he issued his first book containing The Jumping Frog and other stories. Its reception was so cordial that Mark Twain decided to try his fortunes in the East. On reaching New York, he learned that a secret excursion was about to start for the Holy Land in the steamer Quaker City. He persuaded the Alta California, for which he had been writing, to advance him the price of the ticket for this trip, to be paid in letters at fifteen dollars each. He made his trip, which proved the beginning of his fortune for innocence abroad. His first famous book had taken shape in his mind before his return. To write the book, however, and to live at the same time was a problem. But Senator W. M. Stewart of Nevada, becoming interested in the project, obtained for him a six-dollar-a-day committee clerkship, while the work was farmed out to another man at a hundred dollars a month. Innocence Abroad Instant Success the book was finished in August 1868, but a publisher was hard to find. At last, the American Publishing Company of Hartford agreed to issue it. Its success was instant and overwhelming. Edition after edition was sold in such rapid succession that the presses could not turn them out fast enough. Mark Twain had become a man of note overnight. Among Mark Twain's friends on the Holy Land trip, had been Judge Jervis J. Langdon of Elmira, New York, and his two children, Dan of the Innocents, and Lizzie. Mark Twain fell in love with the latter, and it was said afterward that his desire to be near her led him to accept editorial connection in 1869 with the Buffalo Express. But Judge Langdon, who was rich, did not at first favor the union of his daughter and the nearly penniless journalist, and Miss Langdon twice rejected him. He sought a wife as he sought a publisher, and his third proposal was accepted. His father-in-law gave him a handsome home in Buffalo, but the young couple remained there but a year, going to Hartford, where they lived for many years, where Mark Twain did perhaps his most work. His fortune swept away. Two years later the firm failed, and Mark Twain's fortune was swept away. With courage as unbroken as when he could not get a job as a reporter in San Francisco, many years before, he again took to the lecture field to regain his fortunes. He received generous offers to go on tour, and everywhere was greeted by large and enthusiastic audiences. He made a new fortune, paid his debts, as Sir Walter Scott had done, and left the publishing business to others while he worked hard at his desk as ever. In 1896 appeared The Personal Recollections of Joan of Arc, More Tramps Abroad, and Following the Equator in 1897, and The Man Who Corrupted Hadleyburg, 1900. After an extended trip to Europe, he published in 1902 a double-barreled detective story, and in recent years, besides writing frequently for magazines, particularly the Harper publications, the Harper brothers having been his publishers for the last decade or more, he had been engaged with Albert Bigelow Payne, his literary assistant, in writing his autobiography. Much of it has already been published. It was estimated three years ago that he had written 250,000 words and was still turning out something like a thousand a day when he worked. 
Mark Twain had outlived most of his family. His wife died some years ago, and on the morning before Christmas last year his daughter, Miss Jean Clemens, was drowned in a bathtub in their home at Reading, Connecticut. Broken himself, in health, and utterly crushed by this sudden affliction, he wrote on that day, She was all I had left, except Clara, who married Mr. Gabrilowicz lately, and has just arrived in Europe. In 1905, Mark Twain celebrated his 70th birthday with a notable gathering of literary folk. Two years later he was honoured by Oxford University with a degree of Doctor of Laws, though in his younger days he was a great traveller and was known personally to nearly all the crowned heads of Europe. Of late years he had confined his journeys chiefly to Bermuda, whither he was often accompanied by one of his best friends, the late H. H. Rogers, as long as he lived. In nearly all his public appearances in the last five years he had worn white flannel, and even had a dress suit, claw hammer and all, made of this soft white material, whose evident cleanliness appealed so strongly to him. Twain as Printer's Devil His own stories of his exploits in boyhood as acting editor one of the most interesting of all Mark Twain's books, or series of personal sketches related to the crucial but happy-go-lucky period of his life. At twelve he began his own account. He has told this characteristic story of his first literary venture, when the devil got the paper. I was a very smart child at the age of thirteen, an unusually smart child. I thought at the time it was then that I did my first newspaper scribbling, and most unexpectedly to me, it stirred up a fine sensation in the community. It did, indeed, and I was very proud of it, too. I was a devil in a printing office, and a progressive and aspiring one. My uncle had me on his paper, the weekly Hannibal Journal, two dollars a year in advance, five hundred subscribers, and they paid in cordwood, cabbages, and unmarketable turnips. An unlucky summer day, he left town to be gone a week, and asked me if I thought I could edit one issue of the paper judiciously. Ah, didn't I want to try. Higgins was the editor on the rival paper. He had been jilted, and one night a friend found an open note on the poor fellow's bed, in which he stated that he could no longer endure life, and had drowned himself in Bear Creek. The friend ran down there, and found Higgins wading back to shore. He had concluded he wouldn't. The village was full of it for a few days, but Higgins did not suspect it. I thought this was a fine opportunity. I wrote an elaborately wretched account of the whole matter, and then illustrated it with villainous cuts engraved on the bottoms of wood type with a jackknife, one of them a picture of Higgins wading out into the creek in his shirt, with a lantern sounding the depth of the water with a walking-stick. Next I gently touched up the newest stranger, the lion of the day, the gorgeous journeyman tailor from Quincy. He was a simpering coxcomb of the first water, and the loudest dressed man in the state. He was an inveterate woman-killer. Every week he wrote lushy poetry for the journal about his newest conquest. His rhymes for my week were headed, To Marry in H. One, meaning to marry in Hannibal, of course. But while setting up the piece, I was suddenly riven from head to heel with what I regarded as a perfect thunderbolt of humour, and I compressed it into a snappy footnote at the bottom thus. We will let this thing pass just this once, but we wish Mr. J. Gordon Runnels to understand distinctly that we have a character to sustain, and from this time forth, when he wants to commune with his friends in H. 1, he must select some other medium than the columns of this journal." The paper came out, and I never knew any little thing to attract so much attention as those playful trifles of mine. For once the Hannibal Journal was in demand, a novelty it had not experienced before. The whole town was stirred. Hagen dropped in with a double-barreled shotgun early in the afternoon. When he found that it was an infant, as he called me, that had done him the damage, he simply pulled my ears and went away. But he threw up the situation that night and left town. Associate Editor of Morning Glory On the advice of a physician, Mark Twain said he went south shortly after his week as devil, an editor-in-chief in one, landing finally as associate editor on the Morning Glory, 
in Johnson County, Tennessee. He gave this description of his chief. When I went on duty, I found the chief editor sitting tilted back in a three-legged chair with his feet on a pine table. There was another pine table in the room and another afflicted chair, and both were half buried under newspapers and scraps and sheets of manuscript. There was a wooden box of sand sprinkled with cigar stubs and old soldiers, and a stove with its door hanging by its upper hinge. The chief editor had a long black cloth frock coat on and white linen pants. His boots were small and neatly blacked. He wore a ruffled shirt, a large seal ring, a standing collar of obsolete pattern, and checkered neck kerchief with ends hanging down. He told me to take the exchanges and skim through them and write up the script of the Tennessee Press. I wrote as follows. The editors of the semi-weekly earthquake evidently labor under a mistaking apprehension with regard to the Ballyhack Railroad. It is not the object of the company to leave Buzzardville off to one side. On the contrary, they consider it one of the most important points along the line, and consequently have no desire to slight it. The gentlemen of the earthquake will, of course, take pleasure in making the correction. I passed my manuscript over to the chief editor for acceptance, alteration, or destruction. Thunder and lightning, he exclaimed, do you suppose I'm going to speak of those cattle that way? Do you suppose my subscribers are going to stand such gruel as that? Give me the pen. While he was in the midst of his work, somebody shot at him through the open window and marred the symmetry of my ear. Ah, said he, that is that scoundrel Smith of the Moral Volcano. He was due yesterday, and he snatched a navy revolver from his belt and fired. Smith dropped, shot through the thigh. The shot spoiled Smith's aim, who was taking a second chance, and he crippled a stranger. It was me. Merely a finger was shot off. Now, here's the way this stuff ought to be written, said the chief editor. I took the manuscript. It was scarred with erasures and interlineations till its mother wouldn't have known it if it had had one. It now reads as follows. The inveterate liars of the semi-weekly earthquake are evidently endeavouring to palm off a noble and chivalrous people, another of their vile and brutal falsehoods, with regard to the most glorious conception of the nineteenth century, the Ballyhack Railroad. The idea that Buzzardville was to be left off at one side originated in their own fulsome brains, or rather in the settlings which they regarded as brains. They had better swallow this lie if they want to save their abandoned reptile carcasses, the cow-hiding they so richly deserve. Mark Twain says he had written this way of the editor of an esteemed contemporary, John W. Blossom Esquire, the able editor of the Higginsville Thunderbolt and Battle Cry of Freedom, arrived in the city yesterday. He is stopping at the Van Buren house. His chief editor changed it to read, That ass, Blossom, of Higginsville, Thunderbolt, and Battle Cry of Freedom, is down here again, sponging at the Van Buren. Now, that is the way to write, he said. Peppery and to the point. Mush and milk journalism gives me the fantods. Blow to his friends here. New York editors and authors extol the man and the writer. The news of Samuel L. Clemens' death shocked all his friends and literary associates with its suddenness. Although it had been known that he was in a serious condition, no one seemed to expect that his illness would terminate fatally so soon. E. Hopkinson Smith, who has known Mr. Clemens for thirty years ever since, in fact the great humors first came to the city and lectured at Cooper Union, was dining at the home of Mr. and Mrs. George Clark at 1027 Fifth Avenue when he first heard of Clemens' death. It does not seem possible that Sam is dead, said Mr. Smith. We had been friends ever since he first came from San Francisco and gave his readings of The Jumping Frog on the lecture platform. He had the kindest heart in the world. The reading public knew him more for his humor, but his friends knew him as a big-hearted human man. His attitude toward everyone was the kindest. In life and in art, it was always the human that appealed to him most. The humor of his books was the real, the genuine humor. Humor to be lasting must be clean. Clemens' humor was essentially clean. It will be lasting for that reason. 
It was the humor of human nature. There was never anywhere in it any double entendre. It was always kindly. It never ridiculed anyone. It never made fun of the littlest of men. Twain did not make fun of Tom Sawyer painting the backyard fence. He brought out the human note in the boy. And that's what makes us always remember that passage with joy and read it over and over. Colonel George M. Harvey of Harper and Amp Brothers, who was Mr. Clemens' publisher, is abroad. But Henry M. Alden, editor of Harper's, at his home in Metuchen, New Jersey, last night spoke with emotion of the man who had been not only a contributor but a friend. In Mr. Clemens' death, I have lost a dear friend, Mr. Alden said. I feel a deep sense of personal loss, and I can't express my sense of the loss to literature. As for our personal relations, they are much more than those of editor and contributor. Nobody could tell anything about Mark Twain better than he could tell it himself, or, indeed, half so well. He has always been writing his autobiography. I have always believed that literature has lost much by not having had more of his imaginative creations on a higher plane, more works like Joan of Arc, for example. Mr. Alden has published his personal recollections of Mr. Clemens in the Book News Monthly for April. Mark Twain was, with one exception, the best-known American of his time, and without exception, outside of Poe and the New England School, he was our most distinguished writer, said Robert Underwood Johnson of the century. He had the singular distinction of having, so to speak, naturalized American humor in many lands. This, it seems to me, was due to the fact that his humor was not greatly dependent on difficult dialects, but on large underlying ideas and on a keen appreciation of human nature, and on a skillful use of the incongruous. In dramatic effect, in surprise, and in climax, he was unequaled and inexhaustible. I think that these things are likely to give more than usual permanency to his writings. We have outgrown many once popular humorists, but I can't conceive of a generation of readers to whom, on the whole, his work will not be of enjoyable interest. While literally he has added to the gaiety of nations and made us all his debtors, he has also in his serious work revealed an admirable and tender sympathy for children and a chivalry towards the oppressed. So much has he become a part of our lives that it is difficult to think of a world without Mark Twain. His Countrymen's Tributes Express Deep Sense of What Mark Twain Means to Americans Mark Twain's death has meant to Americans everywhere, and in all walks of life, what the death of no other American could have meant. His personality and his humor have been an integral part of American life for so long that it has seemed almost impossible to realize an America without him. Something of this feeling is expressed in the tributes to his memory which, following hard upon his end, have come from all parts of the country. Some of these tributes are printed below. William Lyon Phelps, Professor of English Literature at Yale University. The death of Mark Twain is a very great loss to American letters. I regarded him as our foremost representative in literature at the present day. Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn, his two masterpieces, will live for many years as illustrative of a certain phase of American life. Colonel Thomas Wentworth of Higginson in Boston, it is impossible to exaggerate the loss to the country. Mrs. Julia Ward Howe, now in her 91st year in Boston, the news of Mark Twain's death will be sad to many people. He was personally highly esteemed and much beloved, a man of letters with a very genuine gift of humor and of serious thought as well. Hand in Garland, novelist in Chicago, Mark Twain's death marks the exit of a literary man who was as distinctly American as was Walt Whitman. The work of most writers could be produced in any country, but I think we, as well as everybody in foreign lands, will look upon Twain's work as being as closely related to this country as the Mississippi River itself. We who knew him personally hardly need to speak of him as a man, for all the world knew him. No one ever heard him speak without being inspired and no one ever saw him without being proud of him. George Ade at Kentland, Indiana I read every line Twain wrote, 
for he was a kind of literary god to me. His influence has already worked itself into the literature of our day. We owe much of our cheerfulness, simplicity, and hope to him. Most of all, Twain grew old, beautifully, showing his simple, childlike faith for ultimate success throughout all his adversities. Booth Tarkington at Indianapolis He seemed to me the greatest prose writer we had, and beyond that a great man. His death is a national loss, but we have the consolation that he and his genius belonged to and were of us. Charles Major at Indianapolis He created a new school of humor, the purpose of which was not only to be funny, but to be true. He could write nothing that he did not at least feel to be true. All that he wrote was half fun and whole earnest. James Whitcomb Riley The world has lost not only a genius, but a man of striking character, of influence, and of boundless resources. He knew the human heart, and he was sincere. He knew children, and and this knowledge made him tender. End of article This recording is in the public domain. Mark Twain From the New York Times April 22, 1910 Recorded for LibriVox.org By Linda Liu That Samuel L. Clemens was the greatest American humorist of his age, nobody will deny. Posterity will be left to decide his relative position in letters among the humorists of English literature. It is certain that his contemporary fame abroad was equal to his fame at home. All Europe recognized his genius. The English people appreciated him at his own worth, and the University of Oxford honored him with a degree. His writings commanded a higher price in the market than those of any other contemporary whose career was solely devoted to literature. His public was of enormous extent, from the jumping frog to the diary of Adam. Everything that came from his pen was eagerly read and heartily enjoyed by multitudes. Much that he wrote has already been forgotten, inevitably, and in spite of definitive additions and the admirably practical management of his business in the later years of his career, but nearly all that Jonathan Swift, Fielding, Stern, and Smollett wrote has been forgotten, through their fame, resting on a few books, still lives. Artemis Ward, Mark Twain's greatest predecessor as a national jester, is now little more than a name. Nasby belonged exclusively to the Reconstruction period. For any American humorous writer it would be fit to compare with Mark Twain. We must go back to Washington Irving. But the author of Knickerbocker's ironical history and the Sleepy Hollow legend did not surpass in those denotements of the humorous genius, the author of The Adventures of a Cub Pilot on the Mississippi and Huckleberry Finn. Indeed, it is hard to say that Irving ever surpassed Clemens. Without belittling the first great American prose writer, we are compelled to doubt if posterity will name him in the same breath with a humorist who has just passed away. Innocence Abroad and A Tramp Abroad are likely to be remembered among the great travel books of all time. Full of the audacity, the wild exaggeration, and violent contrasts which distinguish the national humor, they are equally remarkable as a voracious record of fresh impressions on a fertile and responsive mind. Mr. Clemens's more serious works, such as The Prince and the Pauper, an incursion into the field of historical romance, A Yankee at the Court of King Arthur, and Joan of Arc have been read by multitudes with great delight. He has been quoted in common conversation oftener, perhaps, than any of his fellow countrymen, including Benjamin Franklin and Lincoln. He has been honored by misquotations, too, and the humorous sayings of the ancients that have been attributed to him, though he never borrowed. His wit was his own, and so was his extravagance, and his powers of observation never failed him. We have called him the greatest American humorist, we may leave it an open question whether he was not also the greatest American writer of fiction, the creator of Mulberry Sellers and Puddinhead Wilson, the inventor of that southwestern feud in Huckleberry Finn, which, with all its wildly imaginative details, is still infused with rare pathos, has certainly an undying vitality. An emotional and quite unconventional sort of man, Clemens was, whose early life was a hard struggle for existence. He obtained his education where he could get it, 
Presumably his faults were as large as his merits. Intellectually he was Herculean proportions. His death will be mourned everywhere, and smiles will break through the tears as remembrance of the man's rich gift to his era comes to the mourners' minds. However his work may be judged by impartial and unprejudiced generations, his fame is imperishable. End of article. This recording is in the public domain. Austrian Emperor to Take Command at Vienna Headquarters From the New York Times, July 29, 1914 Read for LibriVox.org by James Smith Austrian Emperor to Take Command at Vienna Headquarters War Fever at Capital Crowds cheer outbreak of hostilities and demonstrate at friendly embassies Outbreak of food riots Prices soar as hostilities are declared and the government steps in to regulate them Manifesto from Emperor Forced to grasp the sword, he says, to defend the honor of his monarchy. France fears a great war. Army moves to the frontier. Belief in Paris that Russia will not desert Serbia. Special cable to the New York Times. Vienna, July 28th. Upon the issue of the formal declaration of war against Serbia today, Emperor Franz Josef gave orders for the removal of the summer court from Ischl to the capital. His entourage tried to persuade him that Vienna air would not suit him. But the aged emperor replied, I do not want the air of Vienna. I want the atmosphere of headquarters. The opening of the war has caused the imposition of all kinds of restrictions upon public business. All the railways, of course, are under military control, and the telegraphs are being reserved entirely for the service of the state. The hope is still entertained here that the war will be confined to Austria-Hungary and Serbia. The report that Russia and France have intervened in Vienna is incorrect. In official circles here, it is maintained that any action by those powers must be supported by the third party of the Triple Entente, namely Great Britain. It is known that Great Britain and France do not want a European war. Peace among the Great Powers, or war among the Great Powers, must depend on the action of St. Petersburg. At the Foreign Office here, it is freely stated that now that war has begun, Austria-Hungary will be bound to no more conditions, such as she propounded prior to the outbreak of hostilities. Food prices up in Vienna. There was an abnormal rise in the price of provisions today, which caused great indignation on the part of the public, who flocked to the markets to lay in stores in anticipation of a possible scarcity. Vegetables in many cases trebled in price. Feeling ran so high that in many instances stall keepers in the marketplace were mobbed or assaulted, and the police had to be called out to restore order. The authorities declare that the sudden increase in the prices of provisions and vegetables is totally unwarranted. A permanent committee appointed to deal with the question of provisioning in the country sat today to discuss the regulation of prices in order to prevent the public being cheated. A similar meeting, with the same object, was also held in the Diet. It was officially asserted that there was no reason for apprehension with regard to the food supply and that it was needless for citizens to start the accumulation of stores of provisions. The only effect of such procedure, it was added, would be to still further raise prices. Official arrangements have been made to take care of families of reservists called to the colors. In the event of a reservist being killed or reported missing, an allowance of about 25 cents per day for each adult and 12.5 cents a day for children will be continued for six months. End of article. This recording is in the public domain.